Hi, my name is Ashutosh and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Illinois. In this talk, I'll introduce FreeCache, Folded Logic Reconfigurable Computing in the Last Level Cache. In the age of accelerators, the cost of moving data from memory to compute often ends up determining our end-to-end -end performance and energy efficiency. Therefore, the question to ask is where should we be placing these accelerators? We could place them off chip and connect them via something like PCIe, but here we're limited by bandwidth, it's a power hungry solution, and there are driver and DMA overheads. We could go for an SOC solution and integrate accelerators on chip, but this is expensive and has limited flexibility. Crucially, if we think about edge computing, the working sets here are a lot smaller. Therefore, the cost of moving data from host to device and back can have a lot of overheads. So, something like near memory accelerators seems like a very attractive option. You have high bandwidth access to data and it's energy efficient, but there have always been architectural and design challenges ranging from program transparency to some of them requiring custom instructions, which has a lot of verification and validation overheads. Traditionally, there have been technology and process limitations and even redesigning a sub array or sense amplifier still requires time and money. On the other hand, reconfigurable computing provides us with customization and energy efficiency. And in the world of constantly evolving algorithms, fixed function accelerators are simply not ideal. This is what makes reconfigurable accelerators so attractive. However, their area makes them difficult to integrate in memory. So in this work, we try and answer the question, can we have the best of both worlds? And our solution is free cash. We provide flexible, configurable, cheap, and energy efficient computation closer to memory. And we do this by partitioning the last level cache and reusing the existing sub arrays and data arrays and converting them into reconfigurable compute. In doing so, we provide on-demand reconfigurable computing and it's cheap because we leverage existing structures and we don't modify the cores or the sub arrays themselves. Crucially, you have access to the large bandwidth of the last level cache and you can access these units through simple loads and stores operations. Now we have general purpose customizable computation that we can use to offload small but important kernels. This provides us with better end-to-end -end performance and energy efficiency. Let's take a look at traditional FPG architectures. An FPG is comprised of an array of logic blocks with some global interconnect. Up to 80% of the FPG's area can go in this global routing resources. And the FPG's performance, particularly its clock speed, is actually limited by global routing. The logic blocks themselves are comprised of something called lookup tables. These lookup tables are just memory with some decoding or a mux tree. The memory just stores the truth table of some Boolean expression. Up to 40% of the area in an FPGA can be consumed by configuration memory for the lookup tables and the global routing. A key concept in free cache is logic folding. Logic folding folds a circuit over time and leverages dynamic reconfiguration to share available logical resources. For example, consider the graph on the right hand side. This is a netlist where each node is a lookup table. We've partitioned this into four levels, and on each time step, we can implement one level. For example, in time step one, we can implement lookup table A, B, and C, latch the output, reconfigure the physical lookup tables, and then implement lookup tables D and E in the second time step. In doing so, we implement the entire circuit over four time steps, but only require three physical lookup tables. What we've done here is temporal pipelining, and effectively, we're trading area for latency. Now let's take a look at a modern last level cache. The last level cache is comprised of several slices and the slices and the cores are connected by some central interconnect. Within the slice, you'll find multiple ways and each way is comprised of data arrays, which in turn is comprised of sub arrays. Effectively, what we have here is a lot of dense SRAM. And while accessing the slice may take several cycles, accessing a sub array row only takes one or two cycles. With this in mind, let's introduce FreeCache. FreeCache leverages this dense SRAM in the LLC and logic folding. In order to do so, we add a mux tree and a latch to the output of the existing subarrays in the last level cache. This creates what we call a compute subarray. We can now store in each row of the subarray configuration bits for one or more lookup tables. By simply reading out a new row, we've configured a new lookup table. For example, if we have 32 bits in a row, 
we can store either one five input lookup table or two four input lookup tables. Now we can use logic folding to map a large circuit into this smaller area. Obviously one or two lookup tables are probably not enough and therefore we group multiple compute subarrays with some arithmetic units and limited routing into what we call a microcompute cluster. Since we can read every row from the subarray every one or two cycles, we can reconfigure and create a new lookup table every one or two cycles. And in doing so, each microcompute cluster can provide four to eight lookup tables per cycle at cache clock speeds. Crucially, we reuse the existing buses in the LLC and the existing subarrays. All of the new logic is placed outside the subarrays, and this minimizes our impact to the LLC performance and also doesn't require redesigning the subarrays. Once we have a microcompute cluster, we can map an accelerator to each microcompute cluster. In this work, all accelerator tiles are identical, and they're implemented as a sequence of logic fold steps. A compute cluster control unit sitting inside the cache control box is responsible for driving these sequence of steps. Note that since the microcompute clusters in a way share a bus, including the address bus and data buses, they must operate in lockstep. And for the sake of simplicity, we make all compute clusters in the slice operate in lockstep. Once we've done this, we add some additional functionality. First, we add some lightweight routing to enable communication between neighboring microcompute clusters only. Note that unlike an FPGA, this does not incur large overheads because we don't have wires ranging from one side of the chip to the other side. Therefore, what we can now do is create a larger accelerator tile by grouping together multiple microcompute clusters. Next, we allow for the ways to be locked and set as scratch pad space. This is mainly for avoiding global memory bottlenecks. With this in place, please do look at section three in our paper to learn more details about how we construct these microcompute clusters. Accelerators in free cache can communicate with each other either via global memory or scratch pad space. But crucially, the cores can communicate to the accelerators via simple loads and stores to reserved address spaces. Since all the accelerators are identical, they operate in a data parallel fashion. We generate an accelerator by synthesizing and then generating a logic folding circuit. In order to see how we get the logic folding schedule, please look at section four of our paper. The key point to take away here is that logic folding determines the performance. The minimum number of folds we're going to need is determined by the total number of lookup tables in the circuit and the number of lookup tables available per cycle. Therefore, using a larger microcompute cluster would incur a lower overhead of logic folding, but it also limits the number of concurrent uh, accelerators you can have inside a single slice. Note that by design, we've tried to make sure that we can maintain the cache clock. By not including FPG style routing, we actually are able to maintain the original cache clock frequency. And this is key because we want to maintain the internal bandwidth of the LLC, and we want to compensate for logic folding latency. The effective accelerator clock speed is the cache clock speed divided by the total number of fold levels. The accelerators still need to access data from somewhere, and in order to do this, we do have scratch pads, but they need to be filled. We could load from DRAM, but the LLC doesn't have access to a TLB. Therefore, what we'd need to do is flush the working set from the upper level caches, make sure the cores don't touch the data, and the cores would have to provide physical addresses to the controllers, and then data would have to be contiguous and pinned in memory. This is obviously not convenient and it limits performance. A better solution might be to use the cores to orchestrate data movement since they can handle all of the address translation. They can load data from the DRAM into the scratch pads, but this is obviously not very efficient. Instead, what we do is we directly initialize buffers into the scratch pads. This eliminates one copy operation wherever possible. Finally, we note that the LLC controller operates as normal, and if you've partitioned some of the space to remain as a cache, it'll continue to operate as a cache. For more details, take a look at section three to see how we design scratch pads and do data orchestration. Let's move on to our evaluation. In order to understand the area and timing overheads, we've used Cacti, MCPAT, Descent, and RTL synthesis. The total overhead ranges from three and a half to 15% per cache slice, depending on whether or not you want to include some global routing for larger microcompute clusters. In order to de determine performance and energy, we've used Gem5 and MECPAT, and we use the MarkSuite benchmarks as well as a couple of in-house benchmarks. 
Note that all of our data is normalized to a single thread in the host ARM core complex, and we compare against all eight threads available in the host system, a PCI attached FPGA, and the Ultra 96 SOC FPGA, which is supposed to be a more power efficient solution. Note that we have a lot of flexibility in how we partition the LLC, and here to present the best data, we've consumed up to 90% of the last level cache in order to create either compute or scratch mat space. Again, recall that the effective accelerator clock is cache clock divided by four levels. So while the cache clock might be several gigahertz, the effective four levels are often in the order of tens to hundreds, and therefore the accelerator clock is only in the order of tens to a few hundred megahertz, not gigahertz. For more details, look at section five in our paper. Our first exploration looks at how we should partition the available space between scratch pads and compute. The maximum number of accelerators you can fit into one slice is actually determined by their working set. For example, AES has a very small working set, and therefore we can allocate up to 32 compute clusters and use all 32 compute clusters to create accelerator tiles and maximize throughput. But something like Needleman Walsh or sparse matrix vector math requires having more area dedicated to scratch pad space so that we can fill in more accelerators and again maximize throughput. Note that other than AES and dot product engine, most of the other accelerators can't really realize all 32 compute clusters as accelerator tiles. With that in mind, let's look at the impact of the size of an accelerator tile. By size of an accelerator tile, we refer to how many microcompute clusters are allocated to an instance of an accelerator. Obviously, the more number of microcompute clusters, the lesser number of folding uh, levels that are required, and therefore the lower the latency of a single accelerator. But that also means that you would have lesser number of concurrent accelerators in the slice. Note here that because of our conservative modeling, uh, tile size 16 runs at a lower clock. What we can see here is something like AES prefers having a smaller tile size so it can maximize the number of concurrent accelerators, whereas something like a fully connected layer gem would prefer a balance between tile size so that you can have minimal overheads from uh, logic folding, but still have enough concurrency. Another key factor here is the amount of contention for scratch pad bandwidth. Now let's take a look at the end-to-end -end speed up. Using all eight available slices, FreeCache can significantly outperform the host system. On an average, we're eight times faster than a single thread and three times faster than the multi-threaded setup. In fact, if we look at some of the benchmarks, we notice that AES struggles to compete with the multi-threaded benchmark. And that's understandable as AES has a very branchy and logic heavy code that's better suited for running in the cores. But our computational and memory bound benchmarks tend to operate a lot better than the host CPU system. In fact, we can achieve up to 14x speed up over the host system. Compared to the larger PCI attached FPGA, free cache is not as fast, but the larger FPGA has significantly more resources and also consumes a lot more power. Compared to the Ultra 96, which is the more power efficient solution, we see that free cache not only outperforms it, but is also more energy efficient. As we can see on the next slide, free cache is up to six, and six times more efficient in terms of per per watt than the multi-core solution. And as we, we can see in a lot of instances, we're significantly more energy efficient than both FPGA options. Finally, it's convenient to compare free, free cache to FPGAs. However, we'd like to point out that free cache is not a new FPGA. For mission critical and low latency applications, an FPGA is in fact a better solution. What we've provided here, however, is a more area efficient and cheaper solution that can reconfigure itself a lot faster than an FPGA and crucially is integrated into the last level cache. When we compare free cache to some other approaches towards near and in cache computing, the first thing we make note of is that free cache is a lot less invasive. We do not redesign the subarrays, the peripheral IOs, or the sense amplifiers, which means we have significantly lower design costs. Free cache is not domain specific, and we don't require any custom data organization. But crucially, because everything we place is outside the subarrays, free cache can actually be compatible with other in cache computing approaches. For more details on our comparisons, please look at section six in our paper. We'll conclude here by pointing out that free cache is flexible, configurable, cheap, and energy efficient, and provides general purpose computation close to memory. 
It's a non-invasive style of doing computing in cache and adds only three to 15% area overheads to an, a cache slice. We're three times faster than the whole system and six times more energy efficient. Lastly, we'd like to point out that free cache transforms surplus LLC capacity into compute, providing you with energy efficient customized computation. How much cash is actually allocated to compute depends on the user and how much cash can be sacrificed or how much computation you actually require. Thank you for attending our talk. Please do read our full paper and attend our live talk at Micro 2020. Thank you.